Can a rider buying a full suspension mountain bike get durability and peak on-trail performance for under 2,500 bucks? Vital MT beers, welcome to the third edition of our budget mountain bike comparison test. You know, we're testing cheap bikes and you don't have a lot of money and you're just getting into it. You probably don't have money for gear. So you're gonna borrowing stuff from your friends. You know, I don't have knee pads, got vans, got your helmet, you're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the ponytail's out. <laughs> now, budget is a relative word, and $2,500 is a ton of money to spend on a bike you have to pedal yourself. Over the years, however, we've come to realize that if we want a full suspension mountain bike that can withstand the rigors of lots of miles on legit trails, this is the price range to be in. Any cheaper, and the bikes and their parts just don't perform or hold up to real riding over time. We're testing new bikes here, but never forget the used market which can bring a lot of bang for the buck if you know what to look for. Additionally, new bike prices are changing all the time, with some big sales and discounts to be found. So keep in mind that the prices reflected in this video may differ to what you find today. We rounded up six full suspension 29ers in the 130 to 140 millimeter rear travel range. These are considered trail bikes if you're unaware of how mountain bikes are classified. A trail bike is meant to do a little bit of everything and hopefully do it pretty well. Oh, his foot came off! It has more travel than a cross-country bike, and less travel than what's called an enduro bike. Figuring out what size mountain bike you should ride will come down to personal preference. Our tester heights ranged from 5 feet 9 inches to 6 feet tall. Our shorter testers are on that cusp between medium and large if you look at brand recommendations. All bikes tested are large with the exception of the Giant, which is a medium. And since riding is more fun with more friends, we had Schralper Amanda Wentz on hand to shred the giant, and even had six foot four vital staffer and mechanic wizard Johnny Simonetti throw a leg over some bikes to do some damage and make some shapes for the camera. Principal feedback from the test comes from Jason, Johan, Rick, and Steve. If you have $200 to spend on any of these bikes, you buy a multi-tool first. Some of our test bikes are purchased at local bike shops, while the others are ordered directly from brands online. And the prices here don't reflect shipping costs or taxes. Bikes bought from a local shop will be assembled and ready to ride out the door, while direct-to-consumer bikes require some assembly upon delivery. All the brands we tested provide the necessary assembly tools in the packaging, like hex wrenches and shock pumps. Every bike in our test has 29-inch wheels, hydraulic disc brakes, and a one-by drivetrain, which means there are 11 or 12 speeds on the rear gear cluster and only one chainring at the cranks. While there are component similarities between the bikes, each model is definitely its own machine with unique fit and riding characteristics. This year, for good measure, we threw in a specialized stump jumper comp alloy, which is currently on sale for $3,200. Would that $1,000 price bump provide enough performance benefit to make our testers want to ignore the other bikes? Join us for some fun as we find out and put these bikes through their paces near Reno, Nevada. Hopefully you'll get some insight about which bike may be best for you. Oh my god. <laughs> One, two, three. Jeez, Jeez. Right. <laughs> Go lift up all the bikes. I want to hear which one you think is the heaviest and which one you think is the lightest. Whoa. Okay. The heaviest is the Polygon and the lightest is the Giant. <laughs> you read it here first, folks. I think the lightest is the Norco, and I think the heaviest is the Rocky. I think the lightest is the Giant, and the heaviest is the Marin. Giant, lightest, Rossignol heaviest. Marine lightest, and I guess uh, the Polygon is heaviest. I think the Marin and the Rocky Mountain for the heaviest. What do you think is the lightest? Oh, Marin, Marin, Marin lightest. lightest, Rocky yes. heaviest? Yes. Okay. I think the Marin's the lightest and the Rocky's the heaviest. According to my scale in the garage, which we have the scale here without pedals, the Rosinal was the heaviest, the Specialized was the lightest. Yeah, I, was, I said that was my second choice. Yeah, that was Specialized. Oh, that was my second yeah. Specialized felt, feels light when you pick it out of the truck, but not in that. No, it felt yeah. like yeah. it. Was weight ever a factor for you in these bikes? No. I don't, I don't think weight should be a factor in people's decisions on these. Like, go with how it rides, how you feel on it. Was weight ever a factor for you with these bikes? Not really, no. 
obviously with the price point the bikes are at they're going to be a little bit heavier so um i think that that really shouldn't be the discerning factor though and sometimes maybe you know descending and, and being stable the weight might actually help boom nice let's kick things off with the marin rift zone 229 coming in at two thousand two hundred ninety nine dollars and we'll spoil it for you now the Marin was a favorite among our test riders. <laughs> favorite, favorite bike so far? The Marin. Favorite bike so far? <laughs> uh, the Marin Rift Zone. Yeah. We featured the Rift Zone in our first test, but since then the geometry has been tweaked and travel has increased. The Marin's geometry features a 485 millimeter reach and 65.5 degree head angle on our size large. There's a short stem grabbing onto Marin handlebars with 28 millimeter rise and the Transex dropper seat post has 170 mils of drop on all sizes except small. Marzocchi's Bomber Z2 fork provides 140 mils of travel up front. Out back, Marin's multi-track suspension is damped by a RockShox Deluxe RT shock with lockout and debonair sleeve, earning 130 mils of rear travel. Marin's multi-track suspension is actually a single pivot design, which means there is one pivot between the rear axle and the mainframe. The shock is activated by a rocker link pushed by the seat stay. The benefit of this design on a shorter travel bike shined through as the rift zone was playful and poppy in nature, a trail bike characteristic our testers really value. Despite its playfulness, it handled technical rocky lines with ease as the fork and shock kept the bike composed and balanced. Shimano's BRMT200 brakes with 180mm rotors slow the bike down. It took a while to get them bedded in to full power, and even with a small front rotor they did their job but a 200 millimeter front rotor would be a minimum upgrade for our crew. Marin continues to spec V-Flow Snap 2.35 inch tires with tacky rubber compound and large ground chewing knobs. In the loose gravity fed conditions at Sky Tavern, they hooked up well, but they became skatey in harder pack conditions and provide significant rolling resistance when climbing. Oh! Oh. Oh, <laughs> Dang it, Johnny! <laughs> he said oh, he it's tubeless. Hey, now we know it's tubeless. Rim DeSantis. Brapping a corner, the rear tire exploded off the rim with sealant flying, something we actually experienced in a different test with the same wheel and tire combo about a year ago. How much air did you add? It was at 35 psi. <laughs> There's people coming. That's cheap bike pressure for sure. Don't look at me, look away! <laughs> If we change one thing on the Marin, it'd be the tires. A standout spec of the entire test fleet is the Marin's Shimano 12-speed Dior drivetrain. Ever since its launch, we've praised the durable budget workhorse shifting group and will continue to do so here. Shifting is crisp at the lever and responsive at the cassette. A major bonus with Marin's decision to use 12-speed Dior is that it runs a Shimano Microspline Freehub body. Every other bike in the test uses what's called an HG Freehub body which is an older standard and are common on lower priced bikes. The Rift Zone can easily be upgraded to lighter, higher end cassettes like Shimano SLX, XT, or XTR without the need for a new free hub body or rear hub. Additionally, the Microspline interface means there are a lot more choices for easily upgrading to a different wheel set without having to change the cassette. Microspline hubs are available on nicer wheel sets far more often than the HG variety which means a new cassette could be an additional cost when upgrading wheels on the other bikes. Marin has a winner with their latest rift zone. The geometry and suspension components can handle beginner and expert riding alike, while the 12-speed Shimano Dior drivetrain makes upgrading the Marin's wheels or shifting components a convenient, sensible option over time. Last but not least, if you're a 27 5-inch wheel fan, they offer rift zones with smaller wheels. And if you want to go longer travel, don't sleep on Marin's Alpine Trail lineup that provides similar spec and pricing with more squish. Uh, since the tire just blew up on it, yeah, I put the tires that were on the Specialized on the Marin. Grab a 200 mil front rotor, think about changing tires that would best fit your riding style and terrain, and never look back with this $2,300 shred sled. You can purchase the Rift Zone directly from JensenUSA.com or from a Marin authorized bike shop in your area. That one would look good on the back of the Tesla. Next up is another favorite of our testers, the Giant Trance X29. At the time of this video, the Trance X292 is only $2,280, on sale from $2,800, and that popping amber glow color we received made it a looker. The Giant features a geometry adjustment flip chip, 
but we kept the bike in the low setting, which leaves the head angle at 65.5 degrees and size medium reach of 456 millimeters. Giant's Maestro suspension platform is controlled by a Fox Float DPS performance rear shock with lockout for 135 millimeters of travel. The Maestro platform uses four pivots and two links to create a single floating pivot, which is efficient while pedaling and active while descending. Up front, the RockShox 35 Gold RL gets a bump eating 150 millimeters of travel and was the nicest RockShox fork of our test. The giant contact stem length varies by bike size with small and medium bikes using 40 mil stems while large and XL run 50. The giant contact switch dropper post on a large has 170 millimeters of drop while a medium has 150 mils of drop. The giant SRAM SX 12 speed drivetrain works well enough, but it's probably a low light of the build. SX is common on bikes in this price range, but the shifter and derailleur don't have the same type feeling that Shimano Dior has. Tektro's M745 brakes feature four piston calipers, and Giant considered the capability of the bike by including a 200mm front rotor for extra stopping power. The Tektro levers are exceptionally long, which required us to run them quite inboard for one finger use. And like most of the bikes in this test, getting controls in the perfect place wasn't always possible because the brake levers and shifters would come into contact. On the ground, the Maxxis DHF dissector tire combo was a comfortable, confidence-inspiring pair that helped the trance rip flow and technical sky tavern laps. Our testers felt instantly at home, jumping and cornering the giant, and the 150 mil fork provided an additional amount of stability for bigger hits and rocky terrain. Because the Trance X uses a SRAM SX drivetrain, the 11 to 50 tooth cassette is mounted to an HG Freehub body. Upgrading the cassette to a lighter 10 to 50 tooth SRAM GX or XO cassette would require an XD driver Freehub body, which adds cost and hassle to improve on the hefty SX cassette. Aside from that, however, Giant riders have the benefit of a large local dealer network should any problems arise with the bike. Parts and service should be easy to come by, making the Trans X29 a serious budget trail bike contender. Hit up giant-bicycles.com for more info and to find your local dealer. First cheap bike test session, what'd you learn? I think that the cheap bikes of today, while you know they still <clears throat> cost some money, but they're accessible to more people. You get a, a good value, you get a really solid package that you can, for the most part, pull out of the box and go ride. Despite being the heaviest of our field, Vital testers really enjoyed their time descending on the Rosinal Mandate Dior 11. When we tested this bike a month ago, the $2,499 bike was on sale for $19.99. Now, a month later, as this video goes live, it's just $14.99, an incredible deal. The Mandate has 140 mils of rear travel via Horselink 4-bar suspension platform controlled by a RockShox Deluxe Select. A 140 mil travel RockShox Silver TK fork is up front matching rear travel numbers. Reach on our size large is 477 millimeters. There's a 66 degree head angle, a high 349 millimeter bottom bracket, and long 460 millimeter seat tube length. The standover on the Rosinal was noticeably high, and for short legged riders, that long seat tube may be an issue. Part of the reason it's so affordable is that the Rosinal uses an 11 speed Shimano Dior drivetrain, not 12 speed. Dependable and crisp, the 11 speed Dior performs as well as the 12 speed, but the Mandate has some limitation in that it uses a micro shift 11 to 46 tooth cassette, compared to all other bikes in the test that have either 50 tooth or 51 tooth low gears. A 32 tooth chainring graces the cranks up front, so 32 with the 46 out back on the Mandate. It's going to require some suffering to get up the hill. Additionally, upgrading drivetrain parts gets more complicated and potentially pricey if a switch to a 12-speed system is desired. Generally speaking, mixing 11 and 12-speed parts is not an option. Aside from the more expensive Specialized we brought along, the Rosinal was the only bike that used integrated shifter and brake lever controls. Thanks to Shimano's iSpec EV interface, adjusting control position was easy. Shimano's two piston brakes did well enough stopping the beast thanks to a 203mm front rotor. The tried and true Maxxis Minion DHF 2.5 front tire was paired with a dissector out back and they were mounted to WTB STI30 hoops. That long seat tube is filled up with a dropper that only gets 150 mils of travel on size large and XL mandates. Definitely the stingiest amount of drop in the test group. As said earlier, on the descents, the mandate was a hit with our crew. 
a bit of extra travel out back, some girth to keep it composed, and Max's tires that were familiar made for a smile-inducing experience during Sky Tavern shuttle laps. The high bottom bracket was settled into as the 430 mil chainstays, 30 mil rise bars, and shorter reach worked together to give riders a chance to handily maneuver the mandate through the bike park turns. The big 2.5-inch Maxxis DHF up front wasn't scared of rough terrain, and the Mandate's rear end followed suit without a complaint. The Mandate Dior 11 won't be a bike that a rider will want to take on all-day epics, but its value and performance make it a great machine for a beginner rider looking to up their descending game or smash out some fun laps at the bike park. Rosinal.com is where you can learn more or check out the next-level Mandates, like the SLX, currently on sale for $2,099, or the XT with Fox factory suspension for just $28.19 as of Black Friday 2023. Keep in mind those prices are subject to change. Third cheap bike test session, what did you learn most this year? I learned the rear suspension across the board was better with all of these bikes. We blow through a lot of travel before and now everything's pretty composed. Polygon Siskiyou T8 may look familiar as it was included in our group test a few years ago and since then, almost nothing besides the paint color has changed on the bike. The bonus is that as of Black Friday 2023, the Siskiyou T8 is on sale for just $19.99. The Siskiyou still gets 135 millimeters of rear travel and 140 up front. And it's the only bike in our group, not counting the more expensive Specialized, to feature Fox suspension front and rear. The fork is a Fox 34 rhythm, eating bumps up front, while a Fox float DPS controls the rear end. As seen on our Giant and Norco test bikes, braking is handled by four piston Tektro brakes. Front and rear rotors are 180 millimeters on the Polygon. The only pair of Schwalbies in the test land on the Siskiyou in the form of 2.6 inch Hans Domps. Our large features a 480 mil reach, 335 mil bottom bracket height, and 65.5 degree head angle. The Siskiyou runs a short 35 mil stem with 20 millimeter rise handlebars. As with the Marin in our test, the Polygon features a 12-speed Shimano drivetrain. At first glance, the Polygon one-ups the Marin by giving riders an SLX derailleur and shifter. Looking more closely at the bike we received, however, there's now a Sunrace 11-51 tooth cassette instead of a Shimano cassette like our test bike a few years back. Noting the smallest cog wasn't a 10-tooth, we took the cassette off and to our chagrin, an HG Freehub body revealed itself. Because of this, the upgrade logic we discussed with the Marin does not apply to the Polygon. Polygon and Bikes Online websites still have photos and descriptions indicating an all Shimano drivetrain, but one spec detail on the Polygon site does state an 11 to 51 tooth cassette. If a micro spline free hub is a requirement of your bike purchase, you may want to reach out to Polygon to see what you'll actually get. On paper, the Polygon spec is solid, and on the trail, it continued to prove that it's fun to ride. A 200 mm front rotor would be one of the first things we'd change, giving this proficient descender more stopping power. Interestingly enough, our testers actually preferred the Shimano two-piston brake feel and power over the Tektros. While the Polygon wanted to attack descents, the extremely round profile and compound of the Schwalbe tires had our testers feeling a bit hesitant in rowdier situations, as the tires had a balloony, floaty feeling to them. Despite that, the Fox suspension was happily doing its best to keep the bike composed. Since our test a few years ago, the Polygon still holds its own when it comes to being a fantastic build for the money. The biggest challenge facing the Polygon these days is that there are more contenders in a field it once dominated. Regardless, at $1,999 on sale at the time of this video, the Polygon Siskiyou T8 is a great mountain bike for the money, whether you're a beginner or hard charging rider. Hit up bikesonline.com to shop the Siskiyou. Yeah. First one, no Cadillacs, all Pintos. What'd you learn this week? <laughs> uh, the, the gap between Cadillacs and Pintos is a lot smaller than I might have thought. You can get on a bike for, it's still sub $3,000, which is not a little bit of money, but yeah, compared to the uh, 8K plus bikes I usually get to test, these bikes were very impressive across the board. Straight out of Canada comes Rocky Mountain's Instinct A10 Shimano with the most overall travel in the group and 9-way adjustable geometry via their Ride 9 system. As of this video, the Instinct normally retails for $28.99, but is on sale for $2,029. A Rock Shock Select Deluxe Shock handles 140 mils of rear travel, with 150 millimeters of fork travel coming in the form of a Rock Shock's Recon Silver RL. 
Like the Rosinal, the Instinct runs an 11-speed Shimano Dior drivetrain that is crisp and reliable. Unlike the Rosinal, however, the Rocky is specced with an 11-51 to tooth Sunrace cassette. Paired with a 32-tooth chainring, the Instinct is much more capable on the ascents than the Rosinal. Another plus for going uphill with the Instinct are the fast-rolling 2.4-inch WTB Trail Boss tires. Tektro two-piston brakes with 180mm rotors front and rear are intended to slow the Instinct down. An 170mm dropper post is provided on large and XL bikes. The Rocky ships in the neutral geometry position with the longest reach of the bunch at 487mm. Neutral head angle is 65.7 degrees with a 342mm bottom bracket height. After some laps in neutral, it was decided to drop it into slack mode as testers felt too on top of the bike. Gotta change the feel of it a little bit. The slack setting tightened up the reach to 481 millimeters, head angle was at 65.1 degrees, and bottom bracket dropped to 338 mils. Though geometry was sorted, it didn't take long to see how the spec of the Instinct fell short. The fork, tires, and brakes weren't up to snuff with the rest of the Rocky's abilities on descents. The 32 mm stanchioned recon felt noodly at 150 mm of travel, and two piston Tektro brakes with 180 mm rotors front and rear were also the weakest of the bunch when it came to stopping power. While really fun on mellow cruisy single track, the WTB Trail Boss tires just weren't aggressive enough, and compared to the other bikes in the test, it was the Instinct's build that held our testers back from pushing the bike to its real limits. We'd probably pass on the Instinct A10. But there's hope for Rocky fans, because as of this video's publication date, the Rocky Mountain Instinct A30, formerly $3,400, is on sale for just $2,379. It features a 12-speed Shimano Dior drivetrain, four-piston brakes, Maxxis DHF tires, and a RockShox 35 Gold RL fork. That spec is ready to rip, and you get the adjustability of the Ride 9 system. Hit up bikes.com for more info on the Instinct trail bike line. Tire Exploder, what'd you learn this week? Uh, the limit of the V tire on the Marin and how good the two piston Shimano like M4100 brakes are. Since our first budget bike test a few years ago, the Norco Fluid has received a 10 millimeter rear travel increase and updated geometry. Our Fluid FS A3, which at the time of testing, was on sale for $2,249. It features a clean alloy frame with 130 millimeters of horse link travel rear suspension, 65 degree head angle, and 480 millimeter reach on our large. The rear end is controlled by a custom tuned RockShox Deluxe shock. Fork duties are handled by a RockShox 35 Silver TK with 140 millimeters of travel. Setup is easy using Norco's Ride Aligned guide for dialing in spring rates, tire pressures, and cockpit fit. A 40 mm stem clamped to E13 handlebars with 20 mm rise and 800 mm of width, which leaves plenty of room for customization. The SDG TELUS seat post on our size large drops 170 mm, while XL and XX fluids have the benefit of a 200 mm TELUS dropper. The fluids drivetrain and brakes setup were identical to our giant test bike, as the Norco utilizes SRAM's SX 12 speed drivetrain and Tektro 745 four piston brakes. Up front, however, a 180mm rotor kept us from achieving the confident stopping power of the Giant's 200mm rotor. Our fluid came specced with Goodyear Escape and Newton tires, which is different than what's listed on the Norco website. The 2.4-inch Newton front tire had an aggressive tread pattern for cornering and braking, while the 2.35-inch Escape out back was pedal-friendly with a faster rolling layout. These were a major improvement over the floaty 2.6-inch wide Goodyear tires on our test bike a few years back. The Newton and Escape were mounted up to Stan's Flow D rims, which was a highlight of the Norco spec. On the trail, the Fluid's high 348mm bottom bracket was noticeable and had riders feeling a bit on top of and over the front of the bike. The rubber compound of the Goodyears felt stiffer than the other tires in our test, leaving a loose feeling out back. This resulted in a Fluid that just didn't change direction quickly like the other bikes in our test. In straighter lines and rougher terrain, the Norco handled itself well, giving a nod to the 65 degree head angle. And its higher bottom bracket is welcome when pedaling through technical terrain. It should be noted that our TELUS dropper post had play that didn't impact performance, but was noisy on the trail. An easy fix, but definitely something to keep an eye on is the SX derailleur as our cage bolt came loose just after two runs on the bike. Now it's good. Vital actually gave the highest end Norco Fluid its Bike of the Year award in 2022. 
so we know it's a great platform, especially when shredding more natural, pedal-focused technical terrain. At this price point, however, it seems like the spec is what might be holding the Fluid back a bit. Visit Norco.com to learn more about the Fluid trail bike. You, you live back there, Rick? A lot of noises. Now that our testers have ridden the $2,000 bikes, what do they think of our specialized stump jumper comp alloy, which is currently on sale for $3,199, down from four grand? Specialized offers a stump jumper comp for $2,800, it's currently not on sale, that would be comparable to the rest of our test bikes, but we wanted to see if a nicer bike out of the box for about $1,000 more would be worth the investment. Okay, so we have the Specialized that was basically $1,000 more than any of the other bikes. Would you spend money on that? Or would you get one of the, the cheap bikes and put money into that, into a cheap bike? How much is the Marin? 22? 22 or 23, I think. Yeah, I'd go for the Marin and spend $1,000 on a wheel set and maybe a damper or a shock or something. Okay. Yeah, I would, any, any of the other bikes here, uh, I would take the extra money and put it into changing components where, depending on the trails you have, where you see fit. I think especially with the Moran or the Giant, a thousand bucks would go a really long way and you'd be pretty dialed. I think the Specialized would be an awesome bike for someone who wants to ride trails and appreciates a really good composed bike that handles really well on stuff that's not crazy steep. If I wanted to do steeper stuff, I'd go with something like a Status. The bike that I would buy would probably be the Marin, and I would upgrade stuff as it broke. I would just run it as is for right now. We've had a blast testing these wallet-friendly mountain bikes, and we hope that you've learned which bike may be best for you. Whether you're spending $2,000 or $200, it's all about the ride, and all we want is that you get out on the trails and experience the joy a bike can bring. If you have any questions or comments, let us know down below, and we'll see you on the trails. Whoa!